Good afternoon. Um, welcome, dear friends and colleagues. Thank you all very much for joining us. It is a great pleasure for me today to welcome the German Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, Andrea Nallis, here with us this afternoon. Um, Minister Nallis, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us today. We really appreciate the support that you and your presence are providing to the Just Jobs Network today. Thank you for that. Minister Nallis assumed her current role in the ministry in 2013. Prior to that, she was the General Secretary of the SPD. Minister Nallis has been a long-term member of the German Parliament and has, throughout her career, championed um, good working conditions and championed for workers and their protection. Perhaps one little-known fact to this group here is that Minister Nallis presides over the biggest budget in the German government. Um, and that is both growing, an indication. It's growing and growing. <laughs> it's growing and growing. We like to hear that because no, I think that that's an indication. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I think that's an indication of, of the importance that these labor and social issues are given within the German context, as well as a testament to your own dedication to these issues, which we greatly appreciate. Um, Yesterday, we had a fruitful day of meetings with esteemed participants from around the world, and we discussed how to square higher wages with competitiveness. This year, the Just Jobs Network was very excited to partner with Prakash Lugani of the jo um, Jobs and Growth Group of the International Monetary Fund. And, um, and of course, we are always grateful for our partnership with the Frederick Ebert Stiftung and uh, Dr. Felix Schmidt and Knut Penknen. So key takeaways from yesterday's meeting, I just want to spend two minutes telling you a little bit about the wonderful debate that we had yes, um, yesterday. So our first session was on looking at um, wage moderation and competitiveness. And we had presentations by the IMF and the ILO where they shared recent work and insights on the potentially harmful effects of wage moderation on, uh, as a competitiveness strategy, particularly if multiple countries pursue wage moderation at the same time. Uh, the chief economist of the OECD, Dr. Mann, shared very innovative research with us on the need to move beyond thinking about competitiveness and to focus more on raising productivity, especially through investments in labor, such as skills matching, and how to align those productivity gains with wages and higher wages. We had an interesting discussion on the nexus of trade and wages and how potential regional trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership will affect countries at different levels of development. And we, here we had uh, Dr. Ed Gresser from US Trade Representative's Office as well as, as well as Dr. Tang from the Vietnamese Academy of Social Sciences. And finally, the Just Jobs Network launched its uh, joint network report entitled Global Wage Debates, Politics or Economics. And this report presents data and case studies on wages, especially minimum wage setting in countries from around the world. Um, one of the chapters in the report was a case study of the minimum wage debate in Germany in particular. And here it is worth acknowledging that Minister Nallis was instrumental in getting the minimum wage in Germany, the minimum wage law in Germany. So we appreciate that. And so with that, I would like to invite you up here and uh, look forward to your remarks and, and your insights on the G20 and the European and German context. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Mrs. Stevan, dear Felix, ladies and gentlemen, I, it's one of the responsibilities of the German labor minister to announce the job market figures once a month. It was uh, on Tuesday I did it. But telling the media how many jobs, new jobs, have been created and how many people have made it out of unemployment is also one of my favorite responsibilities. That's because months for months the news is good. 
In fact, the situation is so good that my staff members and I are finding it increasingly difficult to come up with new metaphors to, for the good job market environment. As Labour Minister, I of course don't want to see the creation only of jobs. I want to see the creation of just jobs, quality jobs, which gets us to the name and the mission of the network, which met here in Ankara yesterday, and I'm the honor to be participant today. Creating just jobs for everyone is an important benchmark for my work as labor minister. That's because I firmly believe that just jobs give people dignity and self-esteem. All human beings deserve just jobs, a job that is appreciated also in financial terms. And there are also econ economic arguments for such jobs. Just jobs can make a country an attractive place to do business and they can boost competitiveness. Let me illustrate this point with an example from Germany. In our system of industrial relations, we have what we call co-determination. What we mean by co-determination is workers' right to participate in the decision-making of their companies. This, I, I was in Silicon Valley in the United States last week, some think that it is insane, but it's in Germany very normal. This form of democracy at the workplace is an essential component of a just job. Studies prove that companies with worker participation or co-determination, companies are more innov innovative, I don't know how to express it, in innovative, this English is very complicated, to speak. <laughs> innovative, more productive and more profitable. This is not only my personal opinion, it's well proved through a lot of research. So there is both a moral and an economic case for just jobs. But what is quality job or just job like? Well, let's look at the definition of just jobs network. Just jobs provide people with appropriate compensation, healthcare, pensions, labor rights, and opportunities for economic mobility. I couldn't agree more. The definition shows us just jobs have many features, and that's not enough to only sweep it in front of our own doors. In our globalized world, we need to broaden our perspective and act together with others to make just jobs reality everywhere and for everyone. At the national, the regional, in Germany's case, that means European, and on the global level. Let me start with the global level, which is the one that has brought me here today. Today I'm attending the G20 Labor and Employment Ministerial Meeting. And globally we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to just jobs. The global just jobs index map, which, uh, which your network releases at regular intervals, proves this point. On your map, the world's countries are assigned colors depending on their track records. Countries with relatively good working conditions are pictured in green. Countries with poor working conditions appear in my most favorite color, red. Well, that is something we have to discuss later. Maybe we, sh we can switch that a little bit sometime. In this map, which should be all green, there are still too many red countries. That's why I'm working for just jobs also at the G20 level. And in fact, I'm quite optimistic in light of the ambitious agenda and the efforts of the Turkish presidency. Tomorrow, 
we intend to adapt a declaration designed to advance just jobs around the world, and here are our goals. Inclusive labor markets with better opportunities for everyone and higher labor market participation of women. Better occupational health and safety at work around the world. For example, as a result of more sustainable global supply chains, sustainable also in social terms. This is an objective for which we are also working hard at G7 level during our current G7 presidency. We had launched the Vision Zero Fund and I'm trying to gather money for it yet these days we provide this fund with three millions already from Germany, and I hope I can uh, gather a, a couple of millions uh, more so we can start this, which is my personal point in the German government to uh, launch and play out this Vision Zero Fund. Significantly lower youth unemployment, we will try to fix a concrete number which, which is a goal. We don't want to be only on the level of declaration, but also of the, on the level of concrete numbers to reduce the uh, uh, youth unemployment. The promotion of quality education and quality vocational training. In preparation for the G20 meeting, we also had a look at how labor market and employment policies can help boost economic growth. This true our attention to a number of interesting links, which you also discussed in depth during yesterday's conference, I heard. Among them was the fact that a very unequal income distribution within a society has a negative impact on growth, a fact born of rapidly by empirical evidence. That's why the G20 have drawn up policy recommendations and made aimed at reducing income inequality and at increasing the labor share. This includes things like wage setting me mechanism and minimum wages. Of course, in G20 context, there is no one size fits all solution for combating income inequality. But I'm very pleased that the momentum generated by the academic discourse is now beginning used to talk about the positive growth effects, often activating, protecting, and redistributing welfare state. It strengthens our, uh, our main task to strengthen the welfare state's efforts. We will also talk about the do this during a joint meeting with the finance ministers tomorrow. And my personal part will it be to um, have a speech on the effects of um, unequality and growth there tomorrow. So I can uh, launch some of these uh, debates you had had and uh, I um, appreciate that very much. Taking on responsibility for people and in, in and from other countries is also something that I would like to see in our policies for asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, yesterday I wasn't sure I could come today because we have a um, very uh, problematic situation um, in these days in Germany. Maybe some of you are aware that at the moment this is a subject of fierce debate in Germany. One reason for the debate is that more and more people are coming, far more than ever before. We estimate that this year there will be up to 800,000 asylum seekers, maybe more. That's double the number we predicted as recently as this spring. And that's four times the number of people who ended up coming to our country last year. That's certainly a major challenge. But as one of the world's richest countries, with a good infrastructure and a viable welfare state and a solid budget surplus. 
we are in a position to rise to the occasion. We can do it, but it has to be done. That's my problem <laughs> these days. It's possible, but it's hard work. And here again, just jobs come in. That's because work is the key to integration and participation in society. Just recently, I witnessed this when visiting one of Berlin's hospitals. This hospital offers a program targeted at vocational training uh, to um, refugees. I met wonderful, motivated young people from many different countries who were dedicated to their work and very glad about the opportunity offered to them. Let me put it in the words of a young man I met there. Being a refugee is not a job. We have to give them jobs. That's why I'm working on making, making it easier for refugees and asylum seekers to enter the labor market. To this end, we have already revised a couple of laws. We have, for example, made it possible for asylum seekers to start making a living for themselves earlier than in the past. They can now do so after three instead of nine or 12 months. Uh, after three months, our market, uh, labor market is open for them. Other reforms are in the pipeline. I'm convinced that the large amount of migration that we currently witness in Germany, even if it is unplanned migration, is a great opportunity for us. This is even more important when considering the backdrop of our looming lack of skilled labor. Labor demand is currently at a record level in Germany. The OECD has praised Germany for being one of the OECD countries with the lowest barriers to immigration for high-skilled workers. However, our long-term labor migration is still re relatively low. I think it's because of the language. <laughs> it's like Hindi, you know. <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> Therefore, we should at first integrate those migrants that are already coming to Germany to build a new life here. Let me finally say a few words about one of the most important aspects of just work, which is pay. During the last few years, Germany went through a process that you also discussed at your conference yesterday, you mentioned. For many years, our wages stagnated and in real terms, they even went down. Since the 19th, our low wage sector has also become one of the EU largest. There were several reasons for the negative trend in German wages. In our system of, of industrial relations, one factor was especially crucial. Fewer and fewer workers were earning a collectively agreed wage. After major public and political debates and a trade union campaign that lasted several years, in 2014, we finally drafted negotiated and adopted the Minimum Wage Act. I'm happy that we have it now when the refugees are coming because I don't want that there is income of refugees and a new uh, um, uh, mini, no la, 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 wage uh, market of um, employers that is that, that was really exactly the last time we could do it with minimum wage, was just in time, I must say, um, because we didn't know that these refugees were coming, but it was just in time. Uh, good luck, I'm, I must say. And you must see, there was a really hard fight in the last months in Germany against the minimum wage. Even I implemented the law already uh, there was a talk of slowdown of economy, bureaucracy monster. That was a key word of the debate, bureaucracy monster, because I said we need to know how many hours the people ha work when we want to give them a minimum wage per hour, which is very simple, but that was ha under heart attack. And the minimum wage, but, but in the end, the minimum wage is a success story. Uh, we have not killing jobs, nothing at all. 
our economy is still going from strength to strength. Private demand has gone up, logically. We distributed 9 billion uh, euro more in wages, so the people are, could afford more, they could buy more. It was uh, private demand has gone up, was not a surprise for me. The minimum wage was long overdue, and it's an, a, a very important signal in Europe because we are one of the biggest countries there, and we were the last nearly to implement a minimum wage. So it's also rising up and lifting up of wages all over Europe. And therefore, you must know I'm not satisfied yet. Minimum wage was overdue, but this is not enough. So the next law I will launch in a few weeks is a law that is regarded to reduce work arrangements like agency and contract work. Um, because there was, there was a growing market of especially agency work and also contract work, which are sometimes being abused with a few to depressing wages and decreasing the numbers of just jobs. So in this autumn, I will also launch a law to reduce the effects, the negative effects in this sector. So you see it's not an ongoing story to, um, pre to, to get in an other logic that we don't need this extent of a low income job market hmm? and uh, therefore I hope that we in the end, I, I, I'm, I, I'm now two years in, in, uh, in the job, uh, I have another two years to go, that we in the end have a significant turnaround what the quality of jobs in Germany means, which has, I hope, also effects on other European countries and gives her also legitimation to involve ourselves on the global sector. Thank you.